our speaker tonight. Dr. Andrea Winkle is uh, tonight's lecturer. Uh, she earned her veteran degree from Michigan State University. And then she went on to complete her master's in public health from the University of Minnesota. She joined the US Army Veterinary Corps after that where she was an active duty captain. After that, she worked in private practice for one year and then she went back uh, and she completed an avian medicine and surgery residency at Texas A&M University, uh, working on everything from big cats to hummingbirds. Uh, so she's got a ton of experience and she's worked at uh, an avian exotic exclusive specialty practice at Columbus, Ohio before coming to North Star Vets and has been on her team for a couple of years now. And, uh, is just fabulous. And I, I know she's been doing some, some work recently with um, rabbit hemorrhagic fever, uh, something that is uh, in New Jersey now. And so we're educating the public about this, um, but between her experience with exotics and rabbits and her knowledge of uh, public health and all that, she is like just made for this particular uh, occasion. So without any further ado, Dr. Winkle, why don't you come on stage? All right, I guess we're all set. Um, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Obviously we're gonna be uh, learning about some exotic anesthesia tonight. Um, obviously if anybody has any questions or anything, please feel free to let me know. Um, Phil will be monitoring the chat as well. Um, any major discussions, obviously we can wait till the end. I will let you guys know as we're going through this lecture, there are a couple slides that I'm going to kind of skip over. It will be in your notes, but it's more so things that are pictures and other things like that, just so we can make sure we get through everything because we're covering it all and we have a limited time. So um, again, if there's anything anybody wants clarification, please ask. All right, let's get started here. All the ins and outs of scales, feathers, and fluff. Um, Exotic anesthesia, I feel like so many people get scared by it, especially in general practice, um, you know, because in general, even with dogs and cats, there's no such thing as safe anesthesia. It is anesthesia. You are, you know, anesthetizing an animal and you're putting them in a plane where life and death is out of balance. Birds, reptiles, and even small mammals start to deteriorate the moment they are induced. So unless you're adequately supporting, I am very confident with you know, anesthetizing these patients. But again, one of the big things that we always are doing is that we are monitoring our ventilation. We're monitoring our temperature, interop fluid support. It's very important. And then dedicated monitoring. So I'm not doing this. I have somebody dedicated just to that patient while I'm doing this. These animals can be safely anesthetized for hours with proper support. Even some of our more delicate patients can do this. So let's kind of start off with our small mammals, um, probably the things that most people are going to see the most frequently. And we love our cute little bunnies and guinea pigs. So remember, stress avoidance. Like these guys are prey animals. So they are easily stressed with just simple handling in an unfamiliar environment with unfamiliar scents and, of course, noises. I mean, for example, in our practice, we have dogs, we have cats, we have everything there. And it's very easy for a, a dog to stress out a, a rabbit just in the waiting room. We do try to keep them separated, but it is something to always make sure we kind of keep an eye on. Um, you know, one of the nice things about the pandemic is that it had a lot of clients waiting in their vehicles. So that actually helped our patients out a lot. Stress plus anesthesia does equal cardiopulmonary failure. So these are things, and this is why anesthesia, like in pre-medications, becomes so important. So pain management, that is where we're going to first start with these things. Multimodal pain management, this is not a single drug that you're going to start using. Like we want preemptive analgesic. Avoid the wind-up, you know, you got your pre and your post-op. So we start off with things like NSAIDs. So our big one that we often use a lot are meloxicam. And that extended release by Wedgwood is, will be awesome to try out. <laughs> um, here's some doses, 0.5 to one milligram per kg, um, sub Q, IM, PO for every 24 hours. Sometimes actually in some of our small mammals, I'm doing 0.5 um, mg per kg twice daily. So this is one of those things. Um, it does help 
it really is something. And yes, one meg per keg seems higher than what a lot of you guys in dogs and cats will often use. Opioids that we use commonly are buprenorphine and hydromorphone. Hydromorphone um, is really for those really deep pain, and especially if you need a little bit of sedation, um, that is a really good one. Your levels for hydro is 0.05 to 0.2 mg per kg, sub Q, IV, Q8, or Q6 to Q8, sometimes a little bit more frequently as well, because um, it is a shorter dura duration. Um, so it depends on what you're using it for. Buprenorphine um, is Q8 to Q12, and it's a 0 0.3, uh, 0 0.03 mg per kg. There is a bit of a range again, so you could do. Um, 0.02 to 0 0.05, um, depending on what you're doing. Another thing we like to use a lot um, are local blocks. These are like your trans abdominal plane blocks, your tap block. Um, this is very helpful for some of your abdominal type procedures. Um, so these are some things that you can start thinking about if you're doing some more invasive things. Um, and, and just kind of an idea, if you are sending some things to us, these are things that we are often using as well. Another one that is a good pain management one is meropidin or serenia. Um, in, in rabbits and guinea pigs, it's two migs per kg, sub Q, Q24. This helps with deep pain and visceral pain. So this is something that we use very frequently in our GI stasis bunnies and our GI stasis guinea pigs. Something to keep in mind other than just for anti-nausea. Um, there are things that we often use in these guys for CRIs. So these are great for extended GI stasis issues. Um, it does also interoperatively reduce our ISO, our SIVO max, and it can greatly reduce pain. So a great with multimodal concept as well. So one of the big CRIs that we use, again, in our GI stasis management as well is lidocaine CRI. The loading dose is a two mg per kg bolus IV. And the range actually ranges from 100 to, or 50 to 100 mics per kg per minute. It is a, a rate um, IV. Recent studies actually show that the rate of 100 mic per kg per minute is actually a more preferred range or dose. Um, though I will tell you, I use commonly in between and I will adjust the dose based on the patient. Um, there have been studies that show Buprenorphine alone versus buprenorphine plus lidocaine in a rabbit GI stasis incidence shows that the rabbits with lidocaine recovered a lot faster. So that's something to keep in mind if you're doing any of this stuff at your hospitals. Um, so moving on to other CRIs that, you, especially for anesthesia, fentanyl CRIs, um, loading dose is five to 10 mics per kg. Uh, bolus um, IV, and then it's a 30 to 100 mic per kg per minute. Um, and this really helps in your very painful procedures. Um, it really does help to reduce your ISO rates, um, actually up to like even 42% is what one study was showing. This, because your patients become so fractious and they get so stressed, this is something that can help you make an extended procedure go on. Um, but big things when you're using fentanyl, just like with dog and cats, you should always use, uh, make sure you have airways secured and ventilation available because it does cause possible respiration to, uh, respiratory depression. And no uh, appreciable GI hypomotility should be, uh, is noted with fentanyl CRIs, which is kind of a good thing for rabbits and guinea pigs. So something to keep as a, an option. Another big one that's used a lot in dogs and cats for pain management um, can be used in our small mammal patients as well as ketamine CRIs. Um, your loading dose is two to five mics per kg or migs per kg, excuse me. Um, perioperative rate is one to two migs per kg per hour. Um, but then you can actually use it postoperatively as well for pain management, which is a 0.25 to one mig per kg per hour. This is again, one of those things that's really nice to use for those really painful procedures. Um, we, our neurology department loves to use this for our dog and cats with like, um, the severe back pain. We have those same issues with like our rabbits that break their backs and stuff along those lines. So if you're using them or doing anything along those lines, you know, that may again, be very painful. Consider that this may be something to help. Um, and the other thing to consider is let's say you're having difficulty intubating a patient. This might be something also to consider because it has a low potential for respiratory depression 
at these doses. Sedation pre-medications to consider. I'm gonna give you a couple scenarios of different combos. And this is like our typical young, healthy rabbits and guinea pigs and chinchillas. Um, so combo number one, uh, I love this for our, you know, routine kind of spay or neuter that you just want to get it done and quick and you know you don't want to spend a lot of time trying to get them down because again it's one of those things that these patients are very stressed you try to mask them down box them down they can take a while to go down so this combo is actually very quick to get them in and get them done um, dex dormitor ketamine hydromorphone and i also like to add in glycopyrrolate as well um, just because it, it helps with that heart rate. And then also with our rabbits and um, guinea pigs, it really does help with like that heart rate support. Because um, obviously Dex Domitor does like to suppress heart rate. Um, our rate, our doses there are for Dex is uh, 0 0.03 to 0 0.05 my, migs per kg. And these are all going to be given IM. Um, ketamine is 10 to 15 migs per kg IM, and then hydro is 0.1 to 0.2 migs per kg. The glyco is pretty standard. I, I use is 0 0.01 migs per kg. Um, our combo number two, and this one is one that we can also consider using in our sick to compromise patients as well. Again, depending on how compromised, you still might modify as well. Um, is midazolam, hydromorphone, glycopyrrolate, and then alfaxalone. The key about the alfaxalone that I like to give here is that this is IM. This is not IV, like what you would use like in our dogs and our cats. These medications are IV. Um, they don't tend to respiratory at these doses, cause the respiratory compromise that you may see again with IV doses. Um, midazolam is 0.5 to one mg per kg IM. Um, hydromorphone is 0.1 to 0.2, glyco is 0.01, and then the alfaxalone dose is actually one to two migs per kg. Um, I often start out with one, uh, is a big question I often get, but sometimes I do have to go up to two. Um, and then our, our combination number three is, let's say you're not doing something that really requires like cutting or anything like that. This is just a brief sedation type of scenario that you actually just want them sedated, whether it's like a procedure, a minor procedure with x-rays or something along those lines. Um, this is where combo number three may come into because we're doing the same thing as combo number two, except instead of hydro, we're doing butorphanol, where you get that sed sedative feature to things, but you're not getting quite the pain management to things as well. Um, so this is a good thing. And then Let's say, for example, this is a GI stasis bunny, um, and you just want to sedate it heavy enough to do something minor. You can give it buprenorphine after you've done the procedure to kind of roll back into anesthesia. So um, I throw the dose of butorphanol in there for that reason at 0.5 mg per kg. So now moving on to our lovely little rats and mice, um, we have our combo number one, which is hydroketamine and alfaxalone. Um, I will tell you, hydro and ketamine work wonderful in these guys. The alfaxalone dose is much higher in these guys as well. Um, it's five to 10 mg per kg. I feel like it's very subjective in rats and mice. Some rats, it works really well, and some it looks like it barely touches them. Um, hence, combo number two is where I really like to sit with these guys. Um, dextome and ketamine and butorphanol or hydromorphone, again, depending on my procedures. Um, note the, the dose differences with these guys. Hydro is actually about the same at 0.1 to 0.2 mg per kg. Um, our ketamine dose is actually 30 to 40 mg per kg. Rats and mice just process it way faster. Um, and way differently. Our dextome dose is still about the standard of 0.03 to 0.05. Um, so just keep that in mind. But again, that alfaxalone dose is actually much higher and there's actually some reported doses higher even than that 10 mg per kg. And that would be all again IM. Mice, this is a, a reported one. I often use a lot of that, the combinations mentioned before, but there is alternatives. Um, the literature 
suggest again 0.3 mg per kg. This is metatomidine, so you would half that dose for dexmedetomidine. Um, five mg per kg of butorphanol and 60 mg per kg for alfaxalone. I just wanted to kind of illustrate that there is a lot of variance with the alfaxalone. So if you decided to try to use it um, and you didn't get success, uh, that may be the reason is that there is a lot of variance. And depending on what other drugs you're using in combination um, may affect that. Ferrets. Um, now these guys, on the other hand, love to get sedate. So that really does help things. Um, butorphanol and midazolam are a great combination if you are just trying to do something simple as like just doing an ultrasound or, I mean, sometimes even midazolam alone will just take care of it if you're doing an x-ray. Like it's one of those things that they get knocked out pretty good, pretty easily with the, the, these doses. Um, butorphanol is 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 mg per kg IM and midazolam is on average around 0.5. Don't get me wrong, I have actually used up to one mg per kg and it was totally fine because the nice thing about midazolam is it's completely reversible. Um, just keep in mind, whatever your ferret may be having underlying may affect how, how sedate they get. <laughs> um, additional drugs that may be needed, let's say you're doing um, more, more in-depth procedures, ketamine and, and dextome. Um, again, I like to stick with a lot of things that are reversible for ferrets because, again, they have a tendency to have a lot of things hidden underneath the surface when you're evaluating them. Um, you know, not just one cancer, maybe three. So it's one of those things that uh, walk a fine line when you're doing those, unless you know it's a perfectly healthy ferret, which I, I feel like a lot of them don't end up coming to see you unless they're sick. Um, inhalants for these guys. We have iso and sevoflurane are probably the most common ones that you guys have, um, as well as what we have as well. Um, iso is obviously more cheaper. Um, MAC is one to 5%. Sevo is more expensive, but the MAC does go from one to eight. It allows for a little bit more variability if you need that. Um, the nice thing about the Sevo is that it is faster induction. So for your extra stressy patient, it does sometimes, you know, get, get on board quicker. It also allows for a faster recovery due to the low blood solubility. So it's often preferred in our geriatric patients. So, and also our debilitated patients. So rabbits who are prone to breath holding without pre-meds, this is something to keep, keep in mind because while they're holding their breath, uh, you know, if you're taking for it, taking forever, it can take quite a long time sometimes with some of these inhalants, uh, ISO, I mean, it can take 20 to 30 minutes with something like that. If they've had no pre-meds on board, just due to the whole stress of the procedure, um, in rabbits, slowly increasing of the percentage can actually help with those situations. So um, especially like if you've given a pre-med, you can often usually just mask them. So they're not as stressed. They're taking the breath slowly and calmly, which is nice. Um, our little hedgehogs, I have to throw that in there. We often are for initial exams and our induction, it's sometimes can be difficult to give them any type of pre-meds or anything like that. It often is a mask induction just by a whole chamber induction as a result. Um, that's due to the fact of their lovely spines. Um, doesn't mean you can't give them a pre-med or anything like that, but it does require some additional restraint. But I just wanna keep in my, like point out that that is very common. These guys don't take nearly as long as some of their other prey species uh, colleagues, like the rabbits and the, the guinea pigs, but it is something to note. And like oftentimes, here's some of the ranges that we often are seeing them at. If you're having to maintain at like 5%, there might be some issue and you definitely want to get some drugs on board. <laughs> Once anesthetized, you can give those pre-meds, but um, obviously, like I said, the big thing and why we often do this too is because of those quills. But we have a lot of, of our lovely hedgehogs that come in that are quite chubby. And if you're just blindly poking them, um, it is one of those things that you might be injecting them in a lot of sub-Q fat. And they may never see those drugs at all during your entire exam. Um, so just be careful. And then 
unfortunately, if they really want to get you, uh, that you can get injured if you don't have gloves on and a proper PPE for holding a hedgehog. So sometimes it's just easier. <laughs> Um, this is where I'm going to kind of go over some of the into induction of intubating and um, may require like masking or boxing beforehand. Um, local anesthetics for intubation. Um, this would be lidocaine on the um, glottis because they're very reactive, just like a cat for intubating. Um, Again, when you're doing all this stuff, like think of your previous protocols, again, the, the pre-meds and everything like that, that really helps to spare your isofluorine because while you're doing this, the gas is off. They do get very light very quickly. So if you have something on board, it does help. Um, big thing is monitor your patients. While you're intubating, it is, not, it is possible to stress your patient to death. Um, again, having pre-meds on board really helps the situation. These pictures here are some of the tools that you can use. Um, one of them is a V-gel and the other one is a, a scope that has a, a tube over it for intubating. This is the part where I was kind of mentioning, I have various different pictures of tubes and everything, but these are the types of endoscopes. If this is something that you're interested in intubating or learning how to intubate at your practice, or if you're looking for the equipment to get at your practice for intubating small mammals, um, endoscopy really does help. Whether you learn the technique of side-by-side, -side, which means that you put the scope in, and I have a picture up here soon showing that, or you put the, uh, the tube over the scope to help you get uh, intubate, those are some things that would be helpful. These are the, the actual products that would help you with this. So, Again, I'm going to skip briefly over this if there's questions about it, but it will be on the, the notes that are provided to you. Um, again, size-wise, you're going to go 2.7 all the way down to 1. My most commonly used one, just from my experience, is 1.9. And then there's rigid and semi-rigid, so those are some things to consider as well. Semi-rigid is uh, on your 1.9s and your 1s. Um, also very helpful. How you actually do and what technique you use, whether it's side by side or over the scope is going to dictate which um, scope you're going to get. Um, 1.9 will allow you to do on most tubes over the tube or the tube over the scope. Um, this picture is demonstrating the difference between the angle on the 2.7 is the 30 degree and it allows you to visualize the glottis quite well. Um, versus the flat, no zero degree of the scope on like the typical ones and 1.9s. So it makes a big difference as you are learning as well. And again, here's some images kind of comparing the differences. Um, a, image A is the 2.7. It is a little bit clearer for the whole picture. 1.9, it's not as a sharp and clear of an image as in image B. So again, there's some benefits. I think if anybody can use either of them, depends on what you're most comfortable with. Um, some additional images. I think one of my favorites is uh, image E here, which actually shows going into the trachea. And that is something that you're only gonna be able to do if you do an over the scope um, to intubation. So that's something to consider. We do that a lot at our practice. Um, we do also do the side by side. There are some wonderful labs out there if you guys are interested in learning how to do intubation of small mammals um, and they teach you the various techniques. The side-by-side -side actually can be very easy to do um, and it can actually be done by your technicians and everything in your practices and it's very helpful to, to learn because if you have done do it right, you can actually end up doing it by yourself. Um, Again, it often ends up being a side-by-side -side technique in that situation, but again, the right person knowing how to do things can also do it um, over the scope as well. And these are some lovely pictures. Um, I did put anatomy pictures in here because again, one of the things about rabbits um, particularly is they're obligate nasal breathers. And 
one of the hardest things when people try to do blind intubations is where they end up going into the esophagus a lot. So knowing your anatomy and understanding where you're trying to go and when you're doing that blind intubation, why it often doesn't work. Don't get me wrong. There are people who are excellent at it, but you really have to know that feel and understand where that, that part is and making sure you don't do the slip into the esophagus. Um, and it, it is quite tricky. I can't give you any tips because I'm not good at blind intubation. So, but there are people, we have a technician who is awesome at it. Um, so, you know, each is their own. Um, but here is a blind intubation issues. And this actually shows it going into the esophagus. And that is what most commonly occurs. Again, here's some um, com common endotracheal tube sizes. Again, you'll have that in your notes. Um, talking about endotracheal diameters and their basically airway resistance. The big take home message here is the smaller you're going with your tube sizes. So like in our teeny tiny birds, in our rats, in our, even in our guinea pigs and our chinchillas, these are very small airways. And when you're using teeny tiny tubes, understanding that there is going to be a lot of resistance when you're pushing on those tubes. That can affect how you actually oxygenate your patient. So keeping those things in mind while you're, you're monitoring and you're actually providing um, appropriate oxygenation and anesthesia, because those are things that you don't have to think about when you're dealing with a, a dog or a cat, because their airways are plenty big enough at the rates you're doing. And again, some common tubes that we use. Um, this one I like to point out because most people have not seen these. These are cold tubes. And they are designed so they have actually have a, an area where they can't go past um, a little ridge. These are very commonly used in our bird patients um, because birds are very sensitive, just like cats, to tracheal irritation. And so we do not want to put the tube way, way down into the trachea. Otherwise, you actually will see clots of mucus and blood that come up. And then it is sometimes in severe damage can cause tracheal strictures in our bird patients. This is a silicone endocrit tracheal tube, very teeny tiny sizes. This is the ones and the two or twos and one and a half. Modified tubes as well. So moving from our small mammals, now onto our avian and reptiles. I know that's the hot topic everyone wants to know about. <laughs> um, so again, maintenance, you know, remembering uh, just like our, all of our patients, birds and reptiles do start to deteriorate the moment they are induced. Like the second they are knocked out, if you are not monitoring or supporting them properly, they will die. Like, I, I'm not trying to say that to be scary. It's just one of those things you can't walk away from your patients. You can't leave them under anesthesia. You know, reptiles, you do have a lot more wiggle room, but they do stop breathing and stuff along those lines. So these are things that you need to monitor your patients. Um, having that dedicated person, I think, is the biggest thing to realize they are important. So ensuring adequate ventilation, I think that's one of the, the biggest things. Um, spontaneous respiration is inadequate for most of our birds, um, especially when in dorsal recumbency and all of our reptiles. So if you're waiting for them to take a breath, it's just not gonna happen. Um, a lot of birds will stop breathing as soon as they're intubated. That's not, that doesn't mean something went wrong. That's just a normal response. So, you know, it's not uncommon that we actually will use ventilators um, or they're being manually ventilated. So, you know, a lot of our big cases, if the ventilator is not available, we have a ventilator. Um, we are manually breathing for our bird patients. It's just, and, and it's more frequently, obviously, versus a reptile patient, but it is something to keep in mind. Adjust to match your pre-op respiratory rate and excursions. This is why making sure you have your pre-op vitals is very important. So you have an idea of what, what you should be getting at, especially for our bird patients. Um, the big thing is you want to maintain subtle or suitable, uh, your entitled CO2. That really helps with your pH levels. Avian, it's 35 to 45 um, millimeters of mercury. Reptiles, it's 15 to 25. These are things that you're going to monitor. It's much more reliable than your pulse ox. So these are things that you do keep an eye on. 
it is also going to give you the most success um, outcome as far as when it comes to telling if it's a long procedure, how is this patient going to recover, um, mostly with our reptile patients. Maintaining temperature. This is very important because our bird patients often sit way higher. A normal body temperature for our birds can, is anywhere from 102 to 105, up to 107 and 108, depending on the species. So maintaining temperature, if they drop to 90 degrees, that is very, very vital to them. And like, that's costly. That makes it very difficult for us to get a patient back that gets that cold, where maybe a mammal can tolerate that a little bit more. Uh, though probably no animal should be that low. Just things to consider when you have a cold building and it's the middle of winter or whatnot. So maintaining temperature can be difficult for some of these smaller patients or a reptile. So you have to get creative sometimes on how you do that, whether it's the bear hugger or a hot dog. We like to use um, yesterday's news in a Ziploc bag and it microwaves. It makes a wonderful warmy and it actually maintains heat quite well. Just make sure it's not too hot to the touch. You can put a, you know, a towel or something in between, but it does last quite a while. And the nice thing is if you put them underneath, it's a nice little moldable mat sometimes. Um, monitor at, throughout the, you know, the entire procedure, your surgery rooms, you don't want them too, too cold because again, that stuff will drain your patient. Fluid support. I think this is something that often gets underestimated. I do, I feel, excuse me. Ideally, you want IV or IO vascular access in our critical patients. That doesn't mean that you can't use sub-Q fluids too before you start your procedure to give them a fluid bolus. So let's say you have something tiny and you really can't get IV access or IO access without, you know, detrimenting, like being detrimental to your patient. So consider pre-hydrating and doing things to, to really hydrate your patient ahead of time to keep that into mind. Uh, if you have a patient that you can maintain IV access, you know, syringe pumps, uh, you know, boluses, knowing, you know, making sure it's appropriate fluids for them. Uh, Norm R or LRS, um, birds are 10 mils per kg per hour. Reptiles are three mils per kg per hour. These are their fluid rates. Keep in mind, if you're doing some type of vascular procedure, have chylo colloids on um, board. Head of starch and whole blood. Whole blood is a little harder to come by, especially in our reptile patients, but head of starch is something you can definitely have. Let's say you have a bird who lost a lot of blood. Um, you know, those are some things that you can infuse right away and then talk about trying to get a, probably call us and, and to talk about getting something like a transfusion set up. Um, Though chickens, are, uh, if you have clients that have chickens, those are great birds to be on hand for a transfusion. <laughs> With the exception currently of avian influenza. So uh, maybe uh, make sure that they're not having any birds dying. <laughs> um, monitoring, again, going back to your dedicated nurses, these guys do turn on a dime, especially our bird patients. Um, Literally, they could be breathing, they could have a high heart rate, and the next minute they're flatlined out. So really having somebody monitor, and I, when, I want, when I stress this, do not look at your machines. This is something you need to have somebody getting their hands on it, listening to it, and I am big about Dopplers. Anybody who's worked with me will know I always make sure my reptiles and my birds and even a lot of my small mammals have a Doppler on it. It is the most reliable tool you can have in your OR. And it's the best for your pulses. It's also like the best way you can tell anything, you know, your heart rate's dropping or it's, it's starting to sound weaker. You know, you can make your quick and instantaneous judgment based on even subtle sound changes. Um, you know, ECG, do we use it? Absolutely. Do I rely on it much? Absolutely not. Because <laughs> unfortunately in a bird and a reptile, it's one of those things, it, it does often not correlate correctly to the accurate heart rates or temp, um, rhythms basically. Um, monitoring basically your pulse ox versus your end tidal CO2. Um, it, it's not actually validated in our birds and our reptiles. Um, 
it's also often, and I'm sure many of you have noticed, suffer motion artifact. Um, it's based on mammalian um, algorithms. Like it's, you know, you have to constantly rotate it in different locations. So your tongue, digit, carpus, like wherever it's going to work now, especially if the patient starts getting cold versus your end tidal CO2. This is why intubating becomes so important. It's way more accurate. You do actually see waveforms when you start to not see waveforms that becomes concerning. Um, or if you see reduction in the waveforms, then you get to problem solve why, what's going on. Um, make sure you have a pediatric mainstream to avoid sampling dilution. That's like a technical thing. But here again, those are the numbers for your birds and your reptiles. It is, it is way more accurate uh, of an assessment. So other specific things about our birds, um, this is special anesthetic considerations. Um, they do have unique tracheal considerations. Obviously we talked about the tracheal irritation with intubating. They do have complete tracheal rings. Um, they have also, um, some species have specific um, bifurcated tracheas. Uh, my favorite to give an example is like a penguin. Uh, you go to put a, a tube in them right away, there is a little bifurcation immediately right in there, and you can actually traumatize it quite a bit if you try to jam a tube in there that is just way too big. Um, so just knowing the species you're working with also can be important. Um, and then understanding their countercurrent pulmonary function, that's their bellowing system, their air sacs, and how they take in the air first and it goes to the caudal air sacs and then push it through the lungs and that whole way of the system. Um, it's a high efficiency system, rapid changes, but also be aware of like how the bird is breathing. You don't necessarily want to stick them on their sternum and not properly support them around there so they can't breathe properly either. Um, so those are things to think of. A lovely little picture of, again, the countercurrent of um, their pulmonary function. Um, I put this little chart in here, anesthetic fasting times. This is really important for our various different um, species, especially like our parrot species. One of the big ones I like to point out is our parrots, uh, or in our parrots are macaws. Macaws do often require a little bit longer of a fasting time due to the, them being more sensitive to regurgitating. But depending on if you're dealing with raptors versus a macaw versus a little um, canary, it does vary um, by their body condition, like if they're eating, if they're not, do they have stuff in their crop? So it does become important because you don't want a bird to aspirate or regurgitate during your, your procedure. Um, things also to consider on that situation is not only do macaws require a little bit more, but if they have things like PDD or proventricular dilatation disease or avian bornavirus, they may have more dilated GI tracts and decreased gut motility. So literally you stick them on their back and everything just kind of comes out. So even if you've fasted them for half the day or all day, <laughs> sometimes it still will come out. So keeping that in mind, you may even have to elevate their head. Um, so those are things to really make sure you're paying attention to. Uh, for our, our birds and our protocols, we do like to uh, do intranasal uh, a lot because it's stress-free and our owners usually love that for our brief sedations um, so they don't think their bird is getting poked. <laughs> um, intramuscular is the other options that we often like to use a lot. You can use IV. It just becomes a little bit more difficult, more hands-on. Um, Butorphanol and midazolam are probably our go-to most common ones. For our common parrots, for cytosines, we often use one mg per kg for both. It varies a little bit by species. Uh, for example, sometimes a cockatoo might be, they sedate a little heavier. Sometimes our little cockatiel might require a little bit more. It's, but that's a good starting place. So I always play, uh, put that into consideration. Um, other combinations. So their alfaxalone can be used in these guys. I do not recommend alfaxalone without anything else. Oftentimes midazolam and butorphanol, um, but you can actually, given the appropriate combination, can do minor procedures without gas. Um, but I do, you know, it is something that's been used more and more. 
Um, but I don't recommend it by itself because unfortunately alfaxalone by itself in our parrots does seem to cause a lot of the shaky trimmers that we see sometimes in other species as well. Um, in our poultry and our waterfowl, uh, you're probably going to more commonly use the intramuscular route. Not that you can't do intranasal, it's just not very big holes and you try getting near a chicken's head without it like flinging itself all over the place. I mean, it becomes a lot more stressful that way. They could care less if you poke them. Um, so again, butorphanol, midazolam, but their doses are much higher. Uh, one to two migs per kg on torb and midazolam is actually up to three, depending um, what species you're dealing with. Again, other combinations, you can use alfaxalone, but don't use it by itself. Um, the inhalants are the same, uh, depending on your species, um, there might be a preference. For example, certain raptors actually require SIVO instead of ISO, just based on how they react. Um, they won't go down really well at all with the ISO. So again, keep those in mind. Recovery, make sure you do reverse your medications with these guys. Sometimes with your mammals, you don't have to nearly do it as much, but birds, you will watch them after they get unstressed, just zonk out with their owners and owners get very scared when they sent, go home with their pet and they're like sleeping on the floor. Um, so make sure you reverse the midazolam, flumazenil. It's the, we typically use the same dose. There are calculations and you, I have used double the dose of flumazenil, which would be double the volume of midazolam that I used. Um, and sometimes you don't actually need to do it. If you have that high stress bird, it's not something you always necessarily need to do. Um, the other thing is, is while they're recovering, just make sure you provide heat support. Birds will get cold again, very quickly when they're still under the influence. <laughs> and then our reptiles. <laughs> These guys have a very unique system. Uh, like our birds with their respiratory system, they have a lovely renal portal system that makes things extra fun. Though there has been, especially in our lizards, shown that maybe it's not as much of a concern as we used to think, but some of our older reptiles, um, our tortoises and everything, that renal portal system really does seem to affect our injections. Basically, if you were to give it on the back half of, a, for example, in this picture, it's here, the tortoise, um, the drug may never actually make it to full circulation. It would just be processed out by the renal portal system and essentially excreted. So, um, and sometimes depending on what you're giving, that actually could harm the liver and kidney because it's such a full strength that it's getting hit with. So keep that in mind when you're injecting and always just give your injections on the front half. Um, when you're doing anesthesia for these guys, um, for the respiratory aspect, their respiratory physiology is very unique. Um, it is something to consider. Unlike mammals and birds that are, you know, driven by their, um, the CO2 and everything along those lines, these guys are actually driven by PO2. Um, so that actually plays a factor for even when you have a reptile that comes in and it's in respiratory distress, you throw them in an oxygen cage, you can actually cause them to become apneic because you're triggering it basically essentially this physiologic response to oxygen. Um, it is doing, it basically has to deal with their ectothermic, uh, temperature dependent, oxygen dependent kind of thing. Um, oops. And basically they start with the shunting and the dive reflex that occurs. And so being careful, or if you are providing straight oxygen, that you make sure that you are ready to intubate if they do stop breathing. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they've literally stopped breathing because they're dying. It could be because you've triggered this response. So keep it in mind when you're recovering. One of the things um, in this picture here, that I wanted to show is when we actually recover these guys, we actually do at some point disconnect them from oxygen and we hook them up to an Ambu bag to give them room oxygen. Um, so that really does help during our recovery. Their respiratory rate is much slower. So here's another picture with the tortoise is that you're going to actually start just breathing for them with room air. 
And that does actually make your recovery a lot smoother than if you were to just leave them hooked up to oxygen. Um, Pre-medications and stuff that you're gonna use for these guys, it does vary a lot with our species, um, even within a species. So red-eared slider versus a box turtle, completely different doses. So I just wanna keep that in mind. Um, it is important though, to warm them up prior to giving the medications because there's a lot of them, especially um, like tortoises and turtles and stuff. You give them medication if they're even mildly cold you will be waiting hours for the medication to work. So warm them up prior to giving medications. Um, this, you know, can result, you know, of course, in prolonged sedation. Also, once they go home, even if you thought you've reversed it, uh, I've had owners call and be like, oh, he's still sedate. The next day, two days from now, just because they had horrible circulation. Um, also be prepared to intubate them and manually breathe for them if they happen to get over sedate because that happens a lot. It gets very scary when you think you're, you're not sedate enough and you give them too much drugs and then you go the other direction. Um, I will tell you reptiles handle a lot, but be prepared that you may need to breathe for them while they get the rest of the drugs out of them. Um, so you, you do have a very safe range, but when you notice and you look in the literature, there is a lot of range and variability from an iguana to a bearded dragon. And that is because not one species reacts the same to the same drugs. And unfortunately, that's just the nature of reptiles. Um, assisted ventilation, just keep in mind, it's one to two breaths per five minutes. So you do not need to be doing a breath like every 30 seconds or even stuff. It is a lot less because remember again, they are not dependent on the CO2 buildup. It's the oxygen levels. So common anesthetic agents that we use, dexmedetomidine, ketamine, midazolam, alfaxalone is a huge thing that we like to use now in these guys because it doesn't seem to hang around quite as long as some of the others. Um, and it, it does not seem to have quite the respiratory depression as other medications do. Um, so our ketamine range on average, I'd say we use probably uh, five to 20. There are some that are much higher depending on your species. Midazolam is anywhere from a half mig per kg to two migs per kg. Um, our alfaxalone really does vary. It's anywhere from five to 30. I've seen up to 40 depending on your species. Um, so make sure you're checking um, current literature on that one. Uh, nice thing about amphibians, if you're going to include that in, in this category here, is that you can do some immersion baths. So that is something like you, that's fun to do. Um, and I feel like it's a little easier once you get the hang of it. Um, common pain medications that they use a lot, um, butorphanol, morphine, hydromorphone, fentanyl. Um, Depending on the species, depends on which one actually works for them. I will tell you, morphine works really well for turtles <laughs> um, and, and tortoises, so our Chelonian species. But then you go to try to use hydro on them, it doesn't work at all. <laughs> so, or like Torb works on some, and then fentanyl really works for our snakes, like, and pretty much nothing else seems to work for them. So keep that in mind. And there is a great variability in our dosage as well. Um, uh, having a good exotic formulary on hand is very helpful for the reptile portion because it changes and it changes pretty frequently. Um, one of the things I want to mention that I found really helpful for reptile anesthesia is the CRIs and our TIVAs, the total um, infusion volume anesthesia. This stuff really turns... Uh, anesthesia around for these guys instead of having them out for all day long so you start a, a bearded dragon anesthesia in the morning and maybe maybe it'll be awake before you go home um, this actually allows them to seem to wake up fairly quickly after you're done with your procedure just like a normal mammal would which um, it, it's been very helpful um, basically doing like norepinephrine as a CRI intraop has really helped and it's because it helps increase the blood pressure and it does drop those recovery times. You usually do continue it into the recovery and once they're awake, then you can discontinue it. Um, adding things like fentanyl and lidocaine because it drops your anesthetic gas 
does um, seem to help. I've only played with doses and stuff, but it does seem to help with those reductions of the max on your, your inhalants. Um, but the fentanyl patch also does work on our snake um, patients as well. So putting that on ahead of time, again, with the proper pain management. The other one that I really like that um, started to use quite a bit was the Alfaxalone Tiva. Um, this is something you use intraoperatively, and then you actually discontinue it um, at the incision closure. For any of you who've actually opened up a reptile and then had to close them, you realize that the incision closure is not so fast. It's uh, detailed and slow. So it is one of those things that it is a decent amount of time that they're off this. The nice thing about using the Tiva is that actually most of the time you do not actually have to use gas anesthesia. The idea is that you're fully using an injectable protocol. And when you're removing certain ones, it, they get the time to actually process this off. So it is one of those things. It's new. Um, it's being used a lot more in reptile medicine. The doses do variable, vary a lot. These doses are actually based mostly on lizards. So bearded dragons and um, other monitor lizards, but it is something that, you know, play with the, with the doses, see what you can get. I can guarantee you if you tried it in a tortoise, it probably is going to change as far as the dose wise, but um, it is something that is very interesting and it, it does work very well. Um, your inhalants. You do want to make sure you're keeping that in mind when you're doing that and when to turn it off. So just like the Tiva, sometimes you are turning them off before you're finished your actual procedure, like while you're closing, because it takes that long to get them off, especially if they've been out for two, three hours. So again, what type you use does play a factor. You know, the ISO versus the SIVO can make a big difference um, because it is a faster recovery. Um, and also it's smaller changes if you need it intraoperatively as well. The other nice thing about these inhalants is we talk about them as inhalants, but they, for amphibians, they also can be used as an immersion bath. So that's something to keep in mind as well. You get a frog in and you can actually soak them in this. And um, there are dilutions that you can use for these guys. Again, all these recoveries are, you know, make sure heat support, fluid support, room air, um, reverse all our pre-meds. But the other thing I wanted to let you guys know during reversal, um, during your recovery, is that you can give sub-Q injections to help with waking them up. So let's say you do have one that's extra sleepy, um, which is most of them. Um, epinephrine at 0.1 mg per kg sub-Q is actually something that can help quite a bit. I am um, also would work. I've actually also used it as um, using it for at trigger points. One of reptiles at the end of their nose <laughs> has a trigger point there. And if you, given you're not going to give that full dose in there, but if you have it as part of like, like a splash block kind of a thing, um, and that actually helps because it's a, it's a reflex that's an awakening reflex. Um, glycopyrrolate uh, as an injection um, and atropine is another one. I always like to give a good plug for a good reptile a book because the fact is when you're dealing with reptiles, it's such a variable species. Again, knowing where you can look for new information and update, the, these guys are the ones that are putting out the newest given it's updated every like five to 10 years. So it, it is relative on that aspect of the things, but this is where you're gonna find the newest about some of the drugs as well. And then that's the exotic formulary. It is due for a new one. So keep an eye out for it. <laughs> um, Plums is also putting actually most of these now in the newest, like the online plums. So those doses, I actually have started to see more and more in there as well. Thank you guys. And uh, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer any. We absolutely do, depending on the situation. I mean, ideally, depending on what we're doing surgically, for a dental procedure, we often will use a mask it, unless we're doing like extractions and more extensive things because you want to protect that airway if you're 
putting a bunch of fluid in the mouth and you, it goes back there again, they are technically obligated nose breathers, but when they're loose and they're anesthetized, that can slip and you don't want them to choke. You don't want them inhaling fluid or anything like that. Again, a routine dental procedure where you're filing teeth, not a big deal. But again, you know, again, some of the teeth stuff like that, we often try. Does not mean it always happens. Again, the best people can still not always get it in. <laughs> Be honest, I have not noticed any. Every time I've ever used it, knock on wood, it, it actually has helped in the situation and has gotten my patient off the table. Um, most of those times, it's been in relatively small bird patients. So I haven't been able to necessarily track the blood for a little bit of time afterwards. Um, but I will tell you, almost all of my patients that I've used it in has recovered and gone on further in life. <laughs> they all had serious problems to begin with. So I can't tell you they lived long, like months and months and months, but you know. <laughs> Got a whole bunch, I see a whole bunch of questions uh, on chat uh, and one request. Uh, I'm gonna read the question, but I need you to question because uh, no, one, no one's been at home for years. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Good. The microphone is working right. <laughs> First question. Can the dextone be reversed with an equal volume of antecedent like in dogs and cats? Can the dextone be reversed in equal volume or equal volume of antecedent? Yes. Actually, that is, sorry, I did not mention that. It absolutely can. Um, it can be reversed. And I've actually, in some of our small mammal patients, I've occasionally reversed it again if I felt that they still were too sedate and they did very well. Um, next question. Uh, is there any evidence that intranasal midazolam works in small mammals? Is there any evidence that intranasal midazolam can work in small mammals? I believe that there actually has been some research in it. I personally have not tried it yet, um, but I have heard some talk of it. Uh, and I do believe it has been fairly successful. Though, with that said, I know most bunnies trying to get intranasal midazolam in them probably is going to be more difficult than trying to get a sub Q injection in them. So I don't know if I would necessarily would be on board. Unlike a bird, it's, I feel like it's much easier to do it. Um, maybe you're a guinea pig, but a lot of guinea pigs have respiratory things. So it's not, there's a give and a take on that situation. Uh, I guess this, each situation would vary on that one. All right, next question. I agree with slides referred to, uh, but the fluid rates you showed for IV and IO are those surgery rates or maintenance rates? Surgery rates. The oh, sorry, I got to repeat the question. So the fluid rates that I had listed for the birds under IV and IO, those are actually the surgery rates, the actual intraoperative rates. Um, maintenance for birds is uh, 100 mils per kg per day. Obviously, we divide it over 24 hours, um, and that is just strictly maintenance. Um, reptiles is 25 mils per kg per day, and again, that is strictly maintenance. 100 mils per kg per day. 25 mils per kg per day. No problem. All right, next question. Uh, do you have to reverse your rabbits? Uh, in this particular case, we premeditate, or I'm sorry, yeah, pre-medicate with the midazolam, morphine, alfaxin. For elective surgery, would you reverse the midazolam to help them wake up faster? So, nah. do you often reverse your rabbits? We and so I'm going to answer that question right away. We reverse everything, <laughs> even after like four hours of surgery. Um, we pre-medicate it with midazolam, bup, alfax, 
for an elective surgery, would you reverse the midazolam to help wake them up faster? Absolutely. Um, even though in theory it should be off after that, like 45 or well, 15 minutes to 20 minutes at the longest. Um, with our surgeries, we do find that it, it actually does work. And sometimes, uh, again, I will be honest, we'll reverse the second time. And it, it, I don't know if it's the flumazenil does trigger a true, like a, another response as well, but it does seem to help and it wakes them up faster. We don't always 100% do the second dose kind of thing. It's one of those things that if we have an extra sleepy patient that will do something like that. Next question. Hydromorphone is currently unavailable. What are you substituting? We had the problem with, it was at, talking about hydromorphone being unavailable. We had the problem of hydromorphone being unavailable, but for us at, at um, Robbinsville, or I mean, sorry, at North Star, um, it was a while ago, and I believe we've gotten it back in stock. Um, when it was out of stock, we got to come up with lots of creative ways to come up with pain management. It was a lot of that one combination that I um, had up there of butorphanol for the sedative effect, effect. And then while they were intraop, I would hit them with buprenorphine um, to give that combination of the pain med on board because buprenorphine by itself with our small mammals does not give a sedative effect at really minimal to none. And so when you're looking to try to alleviate a lot of that stress component to our patients, um, it really helps to have something that can give the sedative effect to it. Hence, the um, hydromorphone is a really nice effect to that both because it has the sedative plus the pain med. Um, and then you don't have to follow up in interoperatively with buprenorphine. But when you don't have hydro available, the butorphanol and buprenorphine combo works well. Um, there's, yeah, not a lot of other things that really, unless you want to do one of the other combinations um, in that situation. Right. Um, I've got some more, but does anybody else want to jump in? Did you have one, Sarah? Yeah, when you said that you pre-medicate them with NSAIDs, so like what does that mean? Oh, so asking about pre with NSAIDs. So a lot of our patients, like for example, with dental disease and other things, I will tell you if this is like they came off of emergency or we've seen them, they're already we've already started them on meloxicam or something else. So it's not oftentimes that we're giving it right before surgery. Um, now it has happened where a patient has come in, they either the owner compliance, they didn't give it or something like that. I absolutely have given it that same time, like with the pre-meds and other things. Um, or for example, a patient's coming back for a routine dental and they, they're just on a rate maintenance type thing. So we give it interoperatively in that situation. Cause I know when they get up, they're going to be uncomfortable. So we just give them an injection during the procedure. Yep. So the question was um, the preference of glyco versus atropine. So rabbits do, um, don't process, or 50% at least of rabbits do not process atropine. They do not have the enzyme. So 50% of the rabbits would respond to atropine, 50% of the rabbits would not. So glyco is the one that they would respond to. But unfortunately, when it had gone off that market or it became only available through the compounding, it did make glyco a lot more valuable. <laughs> um, so that did become difficult for practices to get. If you don't have glyco at your practice, absolutely give the atropine. How long does it take with intranasal drops in birds to take effect? Uh, the question is, is how long does the intranasal drops in birds uh, take effect? Honestly, it's as quick as five to 10 minutes. 
Um, I usually will give a bird up to 15 minutes if they don't seem to quite be responding, but I also will, if they're not responding after like five minutes and starting to show something, we'll make sure I put them in like a cage and cover them or, you know, something to give them like a moment to calm down. Because again, some of our patients do get quite stressed and especially if it's that bird who's never come out of the house or been away from the owner, um, or if they're with the owner and the owner is also stressing them out, that's also something too. So sometimes it just needs a moment to just calm down and then the, the drugs will take effect because that's also happened before where the animal's been so amped up that after we're done with everything, it finally hits them. <laughs> Yes. So, okay. The question is about with the tour being on board, um, given inter, then giving intraoperatively buprenorphine, will they still get the effect of the buprenorphine? Correct. But yeah, they know the analgesic effects of buprenorphine. Um, it will. Um, the reason is, is that actually butorf the butorphanol actually will partially reverse, um, or the buprenorphine will partially reverse the butorphanol um, in this situation. So you actually lose your sedative effect. Um, it, yeah. So, but the fact is, is you're already in your procedure. So that should not affect the situation. So for example, again, under anesthesia, you give the buprenorphine, your torb sedation will go away um, as a result, but you're, you have the gas anesthesia. So you just have to monitor to see if you may have to adjust your inhalant or you may consider having to maybe give it more midazolam or something. It depends on what you're doing and, and monitoring your patient again. A lot of times for me, it's maybe you have to bump the gas up a little. Mm -hmm.